Recording in progress. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. Um, as we wait for participants to continue to join us, please introduce yourself in the chat. Um, please tell us what organization you come from, um, as well as what country. We'll just give it a couple of minutes for people to join us. Good morning, everyone. Um, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat um, by giving your organization and country name um, to introduce yourself. We'll get started in just one minute. Thank you everybody for so enthusiastically participating in the chat. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us today for um, our expenditure reporting webinar. We'll start with an introduction on the ASAP2 project um, and then proceed on to our presenters. Please continue to let us know where you're from in the chat. Um, it's exciting to see everybody here today. Throughout the course of today's webinar, um, you will be able to ask our presenters questions through the Q&A box um, located at the, at the bottom of your screen. Um, our presenters will be going through those questions and monitoring them and stopping throughout the course of the webinar to answer questions. So please feel free at any time to ask your questions there in the Q&A box. We'll also have two polls during today's webinar, so please feel free to participate in those. They'll pop up on your screen. Additionally, today's presentation, um, as well as a recording of today's webinar, will be saved on ASAP's website um, at www.intrahealth.org slash ASAP resources, um, and I will shortly include that link in the chat. A brief introduction on the ASAP project, ASAP or Accelerating Support to Advance Local Partners, um, aims to rapidly prepare local partners to have the capabilities and resources to serve as prime partners for USAID and PEPFAR programming in compliance with USAID PEP and PEPFAR procedures for PEPFAR program implementation. We have two strategic objectives. The first is to strengthen local partners as they transition to receive PEPFAR funding um, as a USA prime partner to comply with regulations. And the second is to prepare local partners to directly manage, implement, and monitor those PEPFAR programs. ASAP2 has supported 13 different countries with an additional five countries being supported during ASAP1 for a total of 18 countries. And I see many of you um, are from these countries we support. So thank you for joining us today. Some key results from ASAPs 1 and 2. ASAP has supported 126 local organizations in 18 different countries, as I just mentioned. 113 of those organizations have been local partner organizations and 13 have been local government partners. 
USAID and ASAP has broadcasted 94 webinars with a total of more than 21,000 attendees in 76 different countries. So thank you for joining us today and contributing to these numbers. Uh, most of our previous webinars are available um, as recordings and presentations on our website. And again, I'll send that link shortly. And are available in three different languages, in English, French, or Portuguese. Um, we have some upcoming webinars. The second part of this series, uh, the PEPFAR Human Resources for Health webinar, is scheduled for next week, next um, September 20th. So if you would like to join us, please do, and I'll send a registration link for those interested. Um, we also have a French language um, strategic information series um, that will be upcoming in late October and early November. Today's presenters, we're um, excited to have Aaron Dunlap from USAID, um, who's the Acting Chief of Expenditure Analysis Branch, and Grace Morgan from USAID, the Data Analysis Advisor, um, here to present today on uh, PEPFAR expenditure reporting. So I will now pass it on over to Aaron and Grace uh, to continue with today's webinar. Great, thank you so much, Thanks. Melissa. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Grace Morgan, um, and welcome to the COP22 FY23 Expenditure Reporting Webinar. Uh, we're really excited to have you here today. Um, it's great to see all of the representation of everyone um, who has joined. Um, so if, uh, Melissa, you don't mind, I'd like to just launch the first poll. Um, we'd like to start by uh, hearing from you all. Um, so you should see a poll pop up. Um, and if you can read that and put your response, uh, this will be helpful for us as we get started here. Great. And while those responses are coming in, um, just to repeat again what Melissa kind of said, um, please, throughout this presentation, feel free to use the Q&A box. Uh, we will be monitoring that um, for your questions. So we prefer if you have questions that you put them in that Q&A box rather than the chat box. It's just a bit easier for us to monitor. And we'll be pausing at the end of each of our sections um, to answer some questions. So um, please feel free to engage as questions arise uh, as we're walking through. Um, put those in there and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. Great. Thank you all for your responses to that poll. That's just helpful for us to kind of gauge um, what your experience level is with expenditure reporting. Um, if you could go to the next slide. Great, and one more time, wanting to kind of hear from you all first before we get started. You'll see there's two questions here on this slide, um, and we ask that you pick which question is relevant for you. So if you've done expenditure reporting before, um, we want to know from you what was your biggest challenge uh, related to expenditure reporting. And if this is your first time, um, which I see some from the poll responses, this is um, first time for, for some, what is your greatest concern if you're um, just entering this into the for, for your first time? Um, please feel free to be fully honest in your responses here. If everyone could just take about 30 seconds to think about biggest challenge or greatest concern um, and type those into the chat box. Um, we really just want to hear from you, um, understand what your biggest concerns are. It's helpful for us to be able to cater this presentation to you and uh, make sure we are addressing your biggest concerns. So I'll just pause to give people a second. Great, I'm seeing some helpful responses come through, um, some challenges in really understanding the reporting principles, estimating your expenditures, how to allocate costs, great. 
Um, thank you all. This is helpful to hear. And I'm hoping that through our presentation, we can get to some of um, the answers to some of your questions around that. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. So I'm sure just as as many of you may be wondering, as we're approaching expenditure reporting period, uh, you know, how do we get started? Um, there's so many questions that uh, may exist for you around expenditure reporting. Uh, I know it's a huge lift um, for uh, a lot of partners. And so we just want to let you know that you are not alone in this process. Um, we hope to answer some of these questions that you have during this presentation um, and get into some of these details and show you some of the tools and resources that are online um, so that you can um, go back and uh, get some help when you need it. If you're not able to absorb everything on this webinar, it's absolutely fine. We're going to show you lots of resources that you can um, go access uh, when expenditure reporting really launches. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, I'll just give a quick overview of the agenda for today. Um, so we'll kind of step back and just give a brief overview of the PEPFAR financial framework. I think that'll be an overview um, for many of you um, for, if you've done this before, uh, but always nice to have a refresher for the PEPFAR financial framework. We'll then go into some requirements and review uh, what's new for this year's reporting. You'll see a few different things that are that have changed with the process, so we want to go into detail about those. Um, we can go over the resources that are available to assist IPs. Uh, we'll then be kind of going into uh, a background of how USG eventually uses all of this financial data um, so that we can kind of assure you that this data does get used. It's really helpful for us. Um, so we want to give you some background on how it eventually gets used. And then we have some slides where you'll be able to hear from the implementing partner perspective. Um, so sometimes we have an implementing partner join us to give their perspective. Um, we don't have a partner with us today, but we will kind of just go through um, some slides that have been put together from the IP perspective that goes over some common challenges, questions, um, best practices, so that you can really hear from, um, from them. And then finally, we'll have some Q&A um, sprinkled throughout the uh, presentation as well. Next slide, please. Great, so let's get started in just stepping back to understanding the PEPFAR financial framework. Of course, for many of you, this may not be new, but um, we'll just go into a bit of an introduction and refresher. Uh, you know, you may be wondering why we need to report on budget and expenditure data. And as many of you know, PEPFAR is a very data-driven initiative. Uh, so, so this reporting for expenditures um, really goes beyond just the contractual financial relationship um, that you have with PEPFAR. And it gets to more of the programmatic questions, um, asking, answering questions like, you know, what are we spending our money on? And is this investment, the right um, mix of investment to, in order to reach our programmatic goals. So by you, you know, reporting your expenditures, uh, it's really increasing the reliability, um, the usability, and the timeliness of the financial data that is available to us, um, while also improving accountability and efficiency of PEPFAR programs. Uh, and finally, Having this financial data uh, really helps us clarify linkages between the COP program implementation and achievements um, next to the financial performance uh, and management. So really pairing together what that um, you know programmatic performance is alongside what the financial performance is. Next slide. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with uh, the financial framework, uh, this is just a basic slide uh, with a timeline to kind of show the different activities and when they happen throughout the annual cycle. So historically, from about January through May, um, the U.S. government is internally you know, discussing what their COP strategy is going to be, um, figuring out uh, you know, what they're going to do across uh, PEPFAR-supported countries in order to achieve, achieve program outcomes and to achieve those 95, 95, 95 goals. Um, and so during this time is when targets and budgets are set. Uh, and then we move into the work planning phase, which is June through September. Uh, this is the time when you as implementing partners, you know, take the budgets that are given to you um, and you write up a program narrative um, 
many of you have uh, likely been involved in this process. Um, historically, you would have submitted a work plan budget template. Um, we've seen some changes uh, around that this year and moving forward, um, a budget template is no longer uh, required, but it does still include, you know, writing up a budget narrative um, alongside a programmatic narrative um, to kind of set the stage of what, um, what you'll be achieving with your COP um, strategies and how you'll be using um, the budgets. And then finally, uh, we move into expenditure reporting, which is the time of the year that we're about to enter in um, and what we'll be focusing on today. Next slide. So just to give a general overview of um, the PEPFAR financial classification um, and kind of a background as to why it's structured the way it is. Um, so the, the types of questions that we're able to answer with um, with the type of data that you all are reporting in um, kind of gives us a better uh, context and background um, to be able to interpret the data. So first we're understanding who is spending the money, um, you know, what the partner, who the partner is, um, what agency uh, they are a part of. Um, what is the purpose? So we're trying to understand by the program area classification, you know, is this expenditure being spent on things like care and treatment, or is it something that, that's being spent on testing, for example? Uh, we're able to understand who is benefiting by um, gathering the beneficiary information, which I'll go into more detail about. Um, interaction type is another um, information piece, um, understanding if the expenditure was um, spent towards a, a direct interaction with the, with the beneficiary um, or an indirect. Uh, and finally, the cost category uh, is answering the question of what is actually being purchased um, with that money. Next slide. So I'll be talking through each of these elements um, that are in the red circles in a bit more detail, but I first just wanted to show a big picture of how everything ultimately comes together uh, through expenditure reporting. So you'll recognize some of these elements, of course, if you've done expenditure reporting before. Um, this is kind of the basis of how we think about structuring um, the expenditure reporting template. So what we refer to as interventions are really the basis for budgeting and expenditure. Um, you'll see these in the ER templates um, that you're basically defining an intervention with your expenditure data um, by giving the data different classifications across these dimensions. So we say that an intervention is made up of a program area, so care and treatment, for example, testing, for example. Um, it's made, made up of an interaction type, so whether it is service delivery or non-service delivery. Uh, and then it's made up of a beneficiary. So who is um, the money actually, or the service actually benefiting? Uh, and then specific to expenditure reporting, we are also collecting this cost category level detail. So that's not collected um, with, with the budgets, um, but we are collecting this specific cost category um, for expenditure reporting. Um, next slide. I also just wanted to touch briefly on this concept of site level and above site level costs. So this is another kind of disaggregation or dimension that we put to expenditure data um, and just another lens uh, that we view costs through. So uh, there's we define site level costs as activities that occur at the point of service delivery um, or at the facility level. Uh, and then a good way to think about the above site costs are, um, these are costs that are really supporting the broader program um, or the health system. So they're not specific to one um, site uh, or taking place at an individual site, but they are activities that would be supporting, um, you know, the broader health system. So examples of this would be things like program management costs, um, surveillance, HMIS costs, and things like that. Next slide, please. Great, so um, let's just dive into a few of these program area classifications. So program area is one of the main lenses through which we look at our financial data. 
Um, and you'll see on this slide, there are six high level categories um, that eventually get disaggregated even further into sub program areas. But this program area classification um, is kind of the broadest aggregation that we use at PEPFAR and encompasses everything that PEPFAR does to achieve and sustain control of the HIV epidemic. Um, and as I just described on the on the last slide about these site level versus above site, you can see how the first four program areas um, of prevention, testing, care and treatment and socioeconomic are classified as, as site level programs. So by nature, um, those activities are happening at the site. Um, and then five and six above site programs and program management costs are by nature considered um, above site program. The next classification I just want to talk a little bit about is beneficiary. So this is kind of a second lens uh, through which we view PEPFAR financial data. And there are seven main um, targeted beneficiary groups. And so this kind of answers the question, of course, of who are we targeting with our funds? Um, so the first group that you'll notice is a non-targeted population here. Uh, and so this category is really meant to capture uh, activities that may be targeting the general population, um, or if a service is targeting multiple groups and there's no real way to determine a better breakdown of um, those targeted groups with expenditure reporting, you would choose the non-targeted population um, choice when you are uh, uh, reporting your expenditures. And then the third classification that I wanted to detail is this cost category level of detail. Um, again, this is specific to expenditure reporting period. So this isn't something that we collect um, with the with in, in detailed budgets, um, but we do want to get down to this level of detail for expenditure reporting. Um, so there are 11 different types of cost categories here. Um, you can see there's 10 direct and one um, that's encompassing those indirect costs. Um, and so these uh, cost categories really answer the question of what, what is it that we're buying? Great. So now that we've just walked through kind of all of those different classifications and, and the what is made up of the PEPFAR financial framework, um, just wanting to bring it all together and show you a snapshot here of the expenditure reporting template where you'll see some of these elements that I just talked through um, in, in real time. So in row one, you'll see that this is the program area. Um, so in this particular example, the partner was... Um, reporting on program management expenditure, which is classified as non-service delivery, that's the NSD. Uh, in row two, they selected a beneficiary. Um, again, they selected a non-targeted beneficiary in this um, example. And then um, the number three, you'll see all of the different cost categories. And so you would see here um, the disaggregation of, of um, how those costs were actually spent for that Next slide, please. Great. So that's the end of um, going through just this PEPFAR expenditure um, framework. And so we wanted to just pause. We will have um, lots of other sections where we're going to go into the details of, you know, what's new with this year's expenditure reporting process um, and also give a lot of different resources. Um, so we do have lots of sections upcoming, but if you, if anyone does have questions um, about the PEPFAR financial framework itself, um, we are happy to answer those now. Hi, Grace. Sorry, just trying to access the chat box while also sharing. So um, it wasn't letting me see the, the Q&A box, but let me see if we have questions. Um, we have four questions in the Q&A. 
again, a reminder, if you have questions on anything that was presented in this last section, please feel free to type those questions in the Q&A box. Um, and we will be taking breaks throughout each of the sections. So um, I know there's a lot of good questions here, but um, we will be um, covering a lot of these in future sections. So um, I see one question on, is the template available? We will go through the template in the next section. Yes, it is available. Um, there's a question on um, military under the targeted populations. Um, and that is uh, for USAID that, so PEPFAR is an initiative that is implemented by a number of different US government agencies. And so one of those US government uh, agencies is the Department of Defense. And so some of PEPFAR's efforts are to work specifically with the military population and their families. That is not work that we do at USAID, but that is work that is being done in PEPFAR and that is why that is a beneficiary, um, a beneficiary option. Um, Grace, I can start. Um, giving some of these questions to you as well. Um, we have a question from Pamela on, is PrEP considered a prevention intervention? Yes, uh, yes, PrEP would be considered prevention um, as the program area. Um, let's see. Okay. So we have another question from Pamela on beneficiaries specifically. Uh, for um, would Haitian migrants be considered non-targeted populations not or key populations? This is actually a bit of a tricky question um, because I actually um, I would need to go back and look at the definition, Pamela, because I think this has actually been something that has changed in the last year or so, given some of the um, kind of political shifts that have happened, um, I believe. I, so if you can um, take note of, um, uh, we will take note of this question and we will um, respond when we have a, um, a separate Q&A document at the end of this um, presentation. That is a very good question. It's very specific to Haiti and it's very nuanced. Um, so, so um, I'm just going to note that there's a question on, um, have we covered what's new for this year yet? No, that is in the next section, so stay tuned. Um, the same thing with the re financial reporting interval, we'll be discussing that in the next section as well. Um, there's a request to go back and show slide 14. Give me just one second to see if I can see see the chat and share at the same time. Okay, I still can. So we're going back here and I'm just going to leave this up on slide 14 for, for Josephine to take another look. Also just want to mention, as was said earlier um, at the beginning of the presentation, these, um, these slides and the recording will be posted to the ASAP webinar, I'm sorry, the ASAP website and so you will receive um, a notification or you'll receive an email when that's been posted, probably at the end of this week. Um, and you can also just Google ASAP um, resources and webinars and you can, um, you'll see the webinar uh, and the slides posted here as well. Um, let me see if I can go back. Yeah, um, I'm seeing, me, sorry. I'm Go seeing, uh, yeah, one question on non-targeted populations um, to just give some more details about that. Um, so yes, this non-targeted um, population grouping is um, really meant to kind of encompass interventions or activities that would be um, kind of targeting the general population. So if there are activities that aren't necessarily um, targeting a specific um, population, like key populations, um, AGYW, things like that, if it's just a general population where um, you really can't decipher um, the types of beneficiaries that would be receiving that service, um, you would do a uh, non-targeted uh, population. Um, let's see, I see one question on asking if you would prepare separate templates when you have more than one um, beneficiary. And um, 
The answer to that would be no. You would um, do one template um, and you can put multiple interventions. So uh, for this slide that's up um, here, you can have multiple interventions within this one template. So you can see the second row is looking at the beneficiary and you would be defining different beneficiaries um, across your different interventions, um, but that would be within the same uh, template. Um, Aaron, any others that you see that we could answer? Yes, I do want to note, there's a couple of questions here regarding um, sort of these uh, emergency um, costs for earthquakes or for COVID-19. Um, and so just wanting to also note, and we'll, we'll touch on this again in the next section, but so you would be only reporting on PEPFAR expenditures. So USAID uh, HIV related activities is, are the only expenditures that you need to report um, for this particular um, reporting requirement. So it's just focusing on that. Um, so if there is COVID-19 expenditures, if it's strictly just related to COVID, you would not report that. If it's related to um, the earthquake um, support, you would not report that. It's really only those activities that you do that are related to HIV. We're going to get um, Abdul's question about testing and voluntary medical male circumcision. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, we're going, we can talk a little bit about program management and the indirect costs as well um, in the next section. Um, and then um, there's a question about allocations and I do just, uh, allocations of things like salaries. And I do just, uh, I don't think we necessarily explicitly called this out in this presentation. Um, I think Sushant's slides at the very end for the partner perspective touched on this a little bit, but um, we do, so as you can see in this, this slide that's being presented, and as Grace just mentioned, you can select multiple interventions. And in fact, USAID should have already given you a budget by intervention that is in this format. It's a reference for you. Uh, that doesn't mean that you can't further disaggregate, but you should have already received from your AOR or your COR information about prevention expenditures for adult males or care and treatment, HIV clinical services for um, adolescent girls and young women. You should have already received that from your ACOR. If you have not, you will, um, you will still have the opportunity to reach out and receive that, but kind of half the work is done for you in that sense. You would just need to enter in the expenditures for those different interventions. Um, we won't go too much into this, but one thing to consider is since you sort of already have these interventions given to you by USAID, by no means does this mean that every single, um, that you need to disaggregate explicitly for every single activity that you do in great, great, exact, precise detail. Expenditure reporting is not an audit. Um, you have other contractual requirements that are auditable and are, you know, you're legally and financially, um, your, your other financial reports, such as your SF 425 or 424, things like that. Those are, those are separate um, legal contractual financial reports. This, re what we're talking about right now with expenditure reporting is programmatic data that is self-reported by the um, organizations so that we can better understand programmatically what you're spending your, your investments on. You could have, if you went into great detail for every single activity, you could have 50 interventions or 100 interventions or even more. If you explicitly said every single little thing according to every single intervention, and that's just not realistic for you. It's not probably helpful for us to see if you were an organization that spent you know, $5 million, we don't need to see an intervention with $1,000. Um, it's, it's appreciated that there's that level of precision that you would want to get to. But what that means is that you're able to kind of combine or lump some of your expenditures together. So maybe as an example, you do some care and treatment service delivery and some care and treatment non-service delivery. If you have many other interventions and you do testing, you do prevention, you do some above site, you do some other activities, you work with multiple populations, 
you know, to be able to to call out service delivery and non-service delivery for an every single beneficiary, it's just not realistic. So if you mostly do, as an example, care and treatment service delivery, it's okay if you lump some of your non-service delivery expenditures into that service delivery category. If you're doing, you know, 75%, we don't need to see that other 25% as non-service delivery. Um, the one thing I, and so when you're thinking about these allocations, that's just one thing to consider is you have staff perhaps that work across different um, interventions or you have different activities that cross different interventions. You can think about putting all of the, like all of the salaries in one intervention, but that might not be very representative of the level of effort that's being um, expended by all of your staff. It might be beneficial to look at some things like what, um, generally speaking, what is the breakdown percentage wise of, um, of um, the different program areas for your staff based on their level of effort. Um, same thing with things like travel or for training. It's do your best on allocations that can be spread across the different interventions. And the last thing I'll say, and then we'll move on, is just that, um, you know, consider your expenditure report to be telling a story about what you are spending your money on. So if you are giving us a lot of information, that's really helpful. We also understand that that's very difficult to do as far as the number of interventions you report on. But if you also are not giving us a lot of interventions, let's say you only report on one or two, it's difficult for us to really know the story that you're telling um, through the different um, interventions that you're selecting. If you do um, care and treatment and you are also doing testing and prevention, but you don't list those out as interventions, we will never really know, oh, this partner is also doing testing. They're also doing prevention. We just thought you just did care and treatment. So, um, you know, at the end, that's kind of, I think we'll, we'll stop there with the allocation questions. There's a number of different tips and tricks um, that are at the end of this presentation um, that we're, we're happy to share. And let me move on to the next section. So again, I am Erin Dunlap. I am um, one. I am the um, acting chief of the expenditure analysis branch um, in the office of HIV/AIDS at USAID. Um, and so, let's talk a little bit about um, what the essentially the methodology is for expenditure reporting especially for those of you who are reporting for the first time this year, it's kind of important to know there are different considerations um, on how you should and should not report uh, your expenditures. So what we, we're, we are getting ready to close the fiscal year, the US government fiscal year. And so that means that we are asking our partners to report on all expenditures that have taken place in fiscal year 23, and the dates for fiscal year 23 are all the expenditures from October 1st, 2022, up until September 30, 2023. So we're, we're almost at the end of the fiscal year. You will be reporting on the year that is just about to end. When you're reporting your expenditures, you will be reporting on a cash basis of accounting, and that may be different from some of you that operate on an accrual basis of accounting, um, but this is what's what's preferred for expenditure reporting. Um, and we're asking that you report on a cash basis of accounting from the perspective of the reporting partner. So what this means essentially is if you are the prime partner, you will only report the expenditures that have cleared your bank account as of September 30. If you are a subrecipient, it's the same methodology flowed down to you. You will only report the expenditures um, that have left your, your bank account as of September 30. So we understand that at the end of September, there's a lot of accruals that happen, but those expenditures will just be reported on the next year um, ER report. And so we understand that there's some limitations with ER, that's why this is not an audit, um, but that is the preferred methodology for reporting your expenditures. You'll want to be sure to report in US dollars, so not local currency, um, we are um, also asking that you only report on your PEPFAR funding. So if you are an organization that receives other USAID funds for activities such as malaria, you do not have to report your malaria expenditures 
um, for ER. Um, if you receive, if you do um, HIV activities that are funded by other donors, such as the Gates Foundation, you do not report those expenditures from other from other organizations. You only will report the expenditures that you receive from PEPFAR uh, from USAID. And then we're going to talk about a couple of the changes that um, are in place for ER this year. But the last thing I'll say is that the prime partner, you're the organization that has that legal and contractual relationship with USAID. So the prime partner is responsible for completing ER and ensuring that that data is accurate and that it is complete um, from all of your subrecipients as applicable. So you will need to report ER either um, through this new method of directly reporting your expenditures into the online system datum, datum.org, um, and reporting all fiscal year 23 expenditures for all of your subrecipients and your organization as the prime, or you as the prime need to coordinate um, completing those expenditures on a template as has been done in years past, and also distributing that template to other subrecipients and then you as the prime partner will be uploading and submitting those templates on behalf of your subrecipients. Okay, so let's talk about what is new for this year. Um, there's going to, I would say high level, one thing to think about before I go through the next few slides is that really, if you have done expenditure reporting before, methodologically nothing has really changed you still have interventions you're still reporting your cost categories there's really been not much of a change um, with those you still um, can complete a template and upload and submit into datum it's just the method in which you are working with the datum online system that is different um, and there are plenty of resource materials that we will go through um, so that you can feel comfortable and confident in, in deciding how you would like to report um, and so what some of these changes are this year. So if we're talking about um, the first update, it's going to be, um, so again, those of you that have reported ER will, know, will remember that there was a, a template that you needed to complete in the past. That template, if you go to datum, Zendesk and you click on the expenditure reporting section under guidance and then you go to the template, you will see that the template looks different this year. I will walk through a demo of what that template looks like on this webinar. Um, but essentially, again, what you are inputting is the same, it just looks a little bit different. Um, and so there's essentially three tabs. You can see I have a screenshot there at the bottom. Um, one where you give a little bit of information about a subrecipient. The second tab is called primes or subs over 25K. And then the third tab is called subrecipients under 25K. So this is similar methodology to last year. If you're a sub, depending on how much your expenditures are, you will pick one of those tabs or if the prime, you'll pick that middle tab. Um, and one change related to this expenditure reporting template for those of you who are familiar with ER from last year is that now there can only be one partner organization per template. So if you remember, if I'm a prime partner and I have um, three subrecipients that have expenditures less than $25,000, I in last year I was able to put in my expenditures on the template and then I was also able to indicate those three subrecipients, what their expenditures were on the same template. Well, you can't do that um, moving forward. So if you are a um, prime partner and if you choose to use the expenditure reporting template, you will um, complete a template that is just for your organization and your organization only. You do not combine subrecipients um, you cannot put multiple um, entries. You cannot fill out multiple tabs. It's just one tab for one organization for one template. If you are a subrecipient, you will select the tab in the template depending on whether your spend is more or less than 25,000. Um, and we'll go into this again a little bit more, but that's kind of a big change is you no longer can have multiple subrecipients plus the, plus the prime. It's just, it's the prime or it's the sub one, sub two, sub three, you would have to have that many um, templates. So that is on um, updates to the ER template. 
Um, and then the other change this year is that you will see is that um, it, this is sort of in response to organizations that have had struggles in the past with either um, connection issues or very long lag times or just difficulties um, getting with the file size of the templates, you can now, if you opt into this, if you choose to do this method, you can directly enter your expenditures into Datum. You do not have to complete the template. You will just go into Datum and type in your expenditures directly into Datum itself. Um, if anyone is familiar with um, entering in results data into Datum, it's kind of the same thing. You would be just going in and, and typing that information in there. So if you're looking, this is a, a snapshot of what the online, um, the direct entry screen looks like. Um, I can't currently show it to you on this webinar because Datum is not yet open. It opens on October 1st. So um, this screenshot is, is the best that we're going to have to do for the purposes of this webinar. Um, but if you kind of get an idea for what the, the screen looks like, it's very similar to an Excel template, right? It looks, for anyone who is familiar with ER last year, um, it's essentially the same, um, the same approach, the same kind of look. It's just, it's now kind of more web-based. Um, you can see the cost categories down there on the left. You can select your program area. You can select your beneficiary. Um, if you have any errors or warnings, you will still see those when you directly enter your expenditures. So um, there's a number, it's, it's still very similar. So what this means essentially is that with, you essentially have kind of three different options now, where in the past you only had one option depending on how you prefer to report. If you choose, you can, if you, so the first choice is um, directly reporting your expenditures into Datum. Don't have to worry about a template. You don't have to email things around. You don't have to worry about the file breaking. You just directly go into Datum and, and enter in those expenditures. I think this method is best if you are a prime partner um, and you don't have a lot of subrecipients. I think if you have subrecipients, um, especially if you have a couple, it might be easier to do option two, which is reporting expenditures in the ER template. Um, and so that's just similar to years past. So you will download the template, again, one template per organization, the prime completes one, and then you as an organization need to decide if you want to, how to coordinate that, but you would essentially email your subrecipients, each organization would com complete the template. Um, and then the third option is a hybrid. So let's say I'm the prime partner and I want to do direct reporting. I'm going to directly go in and type my expenditures, but it's possible you still want to email your templates out to your subrecipients to complete. You can still do direct online entry and you can still upload templates. So there's three options as far as workflow. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go too much into um, what this is looking like, but basically the left-hand side, if you're a prime partner, this kind of shows you what your options are for the template on how to complete it um, and, and how to submit. And then again, if you're a subrecipient, if the threshold is um, expenditures greater than or less than $25,000, um, the, the level of detail in which you need to complete is outlined here. Just a review of some of the timelines. Um, uh, again, I, I'll let you look at this on your own. We're, we're inching very close to October 1st. Um, datum will open on October 2nd, actually. Um, and then that's essentially the soonest in which you can upload and begin submitting your ER um, and your HRH reports, all of your Q4 reporting, basically. But the biggest, dead, the biggest two deadlines that you're working toward is going to be November 14th. And that is the initial deadline for data collection. So it's important that you are really bookmarking that date to say, we have our submission, um, it, it's successfully, our expenditures are successfully submitted as of November 14th. It's pretty critical that you have information in there because after November 14th, USAID, your activity managers and any other reviewers will be doing a data review of what you submitted. And it's possible that they will have suggestions for changes. Let's say your ACOR knew that you had a budget of a million and that you spent around a million, but you only submitted an ER report of 250,000. 
the AOR may ask you, well, why didn't you report the other 750,000? And, you know, this has happened. Partners said, oh, we just, we forgot. We don't, we, we thought it was a complete report, but it wasn't. So USAID, when they do their review, that happens um, after your submission of November 14th. And then you will have until December 15th, essentially, to make any final revisions. And so once December 15th, um, and that's a hard deadline, I should say, um, this, we have no control over the system when it opens and when it closes, but when it closes, that's it. ER is something that you can't do overnight. Um, this is something that um, we've talked to a lot of partners. It can take weeks to, to really pull together. If this is your first year doing ER, I strongly suggest that you do not wait until November 1st to start looking at how you're going to complete this. There's a number of different challenges that happen. And again, you're telling a story to USAID about what you're doing. You do not want to rush this information and you do not want to give us information that is not representative of what your organization does. So um, mark that November 15, 14th deadline down and, and tr try to work at ER a little bit every day or every week. Um, and I would aim to try and submit um, in advance, uh, maybe the beginning of the, that week. Um, there's always, always problems when it comes to submitting the data. There's errors in the template or the system can be down. Everybody is going into data around the world at the same time. And if you have challenges or problems, you forgot your password, you don't see your mechanism, whatever it may be, there is a help desk that can help you. But the closer it gets to that deadline, the longer the queue is going to be for um, for technical assistance. So um, start early and um, work at it a little bit every day. OK, one more slide here on datum accounts or two more slides here, and then um, we'll go into some demos. Um, you so when you're ready to start either entering in your expenditures directly into the system or when you're ready to begin uploading and submitting your er template whichever you choose um, you will need to have an account for the online system datum.org and it's rep it's um, suggested that you have at least one person but frankly it's great to have multiple people that have account datum accounts for er um, because if somebody's sick or if somebody leaves the organization or whatever it may be, you don't want to find out again the day of submission, oh shoot, so and so had the had the login credentials and they're not here anymore, or they're not here today, and we don't know how to submit. So um, and another thing that you could do is an organization, you could just create your own um, your own credentials for your organization and then just share that general uh, username and password with anyone that you think needs to know it. Um, I mentioned again, the prime partner is the one who is responsible for submitting the ER report. If you are an organization that is a subrecipient, you must complete, you must submit an ER report, but you are submitting that to your prime partner. You do not have to worry about going into datum if you are a subrecipient organization. Your contractual relationship is with the prime, and then the prime's contractual relationship is with the US government. So um, no worries if you're a subrecipient on the on datum entry and access, but you still need to complete ER. And then these next three bullets essentially are talking about what you need to do if you don't have an account or if your account's been deactivated, um, you can go through these steps um, uh, to get um, activated again. I would just say one of the first things I'd recommend doing is just testing your datum account. It doesn't take that long. I would say the first week or second week in October, do this first. Even if you're not even working on your report, at least get your, your login credentials sorted. Okay, I'm not gonna go through this either, but essentially um, every organization, um, particularly the prime partners, if you're going to be a US government vendor, you have been assigned what is called a unique entity identifier or a UEI. And so you are in the US government system with this UEI number. You must be reporting, again, for the prime partners, you must report to ER and have this UEI um, available. This is again why I say don't wait until the last minute. If you do not know what your UEI is, um, you can, there's a link here um, where I have more background information where you can find out how to search um, a database to try to find your UEI if you're a prime partner. You can also reach out to your ACOR to see if they have additional guidance. Um, and then as um, 
prime partners are going to be um, submitting subrecipient information. Here's some guidance on what to do if a subrecipient does not have a UEI. Some recipients do, some recipients don't. Um, so just a note here, um, if you get stuck with UEIs, don't forget about this presentation and come back. Okay, let's do a demo. I will take questions. Let me just go through um, a demo. Give me just a few more minutes and then we'll take questions on, on um, the, uh, the template and the online direct entry. I'm currently showing the expenditure reporting template. If you are not seeing them on the screen, someone please come off mute and let me know. But as I showed in the one slide, um, this is what the, the refreshed and the new ER template looks like, or the offline ER template. Um, we have a basic instructions kind of background tab. There's a tab that a subrecipient would fill out if this is a subrecipient who is, who's going to complete this template. And then you have two options, basically, for where you enter your expenditures. If you are a prime partner or if you are a subrecipient who has spent more than 25000 you will complete this tab because you are required to give cost category detail if you meet, if you are, if you are essentially a prime or if you have spent more than 25000 you will have to give us that cost category detail. If you are a subrecipient that has spent less than $25,000, you are still going to have to give us program area and beneficiary, but you don't have to break that down for us by cost category. You just have to give us one number. So I'm going to complete this first as if I am a prime partner, okay? And so the first thing that I'm going to do, let's just quickly, let's just pick program management. Um, I'm not a mechanism and closeout, so I'm just going to pick program management as a beneficiary. That's your first requirement is your program area. And then beneficiary, I'm going to go through and I'm going to select non-targeted, non-disaggregated. Program management, we'll, we'll get to this a little bit later, but let me work on putting in two other interventions here. So I'm going to do care and treatment service, um, service delivery, and then I'm going to do HIV testing. Um, let's do community-based testing non-service delivery. So I have one that's service delivery here and one that's non-service delivery. And then I'm going to select the beneficiaries that relate to these expenditures. So let's say my organization primarily focuses on HIV clinical services to kind of like the general population. So I'm going to select non-targeted, non-disaggregated. Um, you, again, you may select um, you know, four, five, six, you can go up to I think 35 different interventions um, again, it really depends on, uh, number one, the budget by intervention that USAID gave you a year ago for COP 21, fiscal year, what, COP 22, fiscal year 23, um, but then also just what may have happened during implementation. Um, and then uh, let's say for community-based testing, our organization mainly works with um, adult men. So I've entered in my program areas and I've entered in my beneficiaries. Now I'm just going to enter in my expenditures. And for the sake of this demo, I'm just going to put in um, a dollar here. And I want to go all the way down to show you so that we can talk a little bit about some of these warnings and errors, because you can see here that we have some boxes that have changed colors. And then I'm going to just put some expenditures in for this intervention as well. Again, I'm just reporting as a prime partner for right now. So one thing I want to note is that if, again, this is one part, one organization per template. So let's say I've completed the template for the prime partner, I'm done. Now I want to enter in some information for the subrecipient. If we go to the subrecipient under 25K tab, you'll see this is now grayed out. We can't enter anything in here, right? And that's because one template per organization. I've already I've already entered in expenditures for one organization here, the prime partner. So I'm no longer able, if I have subrecipients with spend under 25, I can't, I can't enter that here. I would have to send this template blank to the, all of my subrecipients with spend less than 25,000 and each individual organization will complete this. Um, and let's say, for example, that I've entered in um, expenditures as a subrecipient that has spent more than 25000 An additional step that you will have to do if you're the subrecipient that has entered in 
uh, information here is you will have to go to the subrecipient organization tab and put in these two pieces of information. So I'll type in subrecipient organization ABC. That's the name of my organization. And remember, I briefly touched on that unique entity identifier or UEI. Um, again, you as an organization are responsible for knowing if you have a UEI and if you do not have a UEI. If you do not have a UEI, again, this is the slide that I was just showing. One thing that you can do is just type in um, the number, I, th <laughs> I think it's the number one that I just showed. It was the number one or the number nine. The number one, 12 times. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And I enter that in. The, I'm just saying that my organization does not have a UEI. Um, if you enter in an incorrect UEI, let's say I do this, you're going to get um, an error. So you do need to resolve this. You cannot leave it blank. You cannot leave it as an error. You cannot submit this template successfully unless you know what you need to put in this uh, for this cell, which is why, again, you want to not wait until the last minute for ER. Okay, so let's go back to the template and review now, regardless if I'm a prime or a sub that entered in this information, let's better understand what these color boxes mean. So first off, we want to look at that we're talking about care and treatment, HIV clinical services, service delivery. And so what that means essentially is these are expenditures that this organization is saying have direct, um, direct interaction with the beneficiary. Um, and it's usually at a point of service, uh, point of service delivery. So you're talking about a laboratory or you're talking about a community site, a health facility, um, something like that. That is essentially what we're talking about when we're reporting expenditures under service delivery. So if we look at this first category of international travel, if you think about it, travel between one country and another that may be taking place for whatever valid activity, that doesn't really relate to specific activities that happen at like a health clinic, right? That is more of a, of a non-service delivery um, example because we're really only trying to focus on um, those expenditures at the point of service delivery um, when we're talking about HIV clinical services. So this box is yellow and the yellow boxes are essentially a warning. What a warning means is it's it's basically asking you to say, are you sure that you want to report this expenditure in this box? Are you sure you don't want to actually put it in this box for non-service delivery? And if you remember the example that I gave um, a little bit ago where I was talking about, you know, there's kind of an art, not a science to the number of interventions you have. And it's possible that this organization does do a little bit of non-service delivery for HIV clinical services. But let's say they have 15 different interventions that they're eventually going to report on. And let's say the non-service delivery care and treatment work is only like a couple thousand dollars. It really doesn't matter if you want to just lump that thousand dollars in with your service delivery because it's not going to change the data that much um, to go ahead and report those non-service delivery expenditures as part of service delivery. Um, and that's just, again, another one of those limitations to ER is it's not an exact science. We want to get it as close as possible, but we also want to be reasonable and not have 50 different interventions for service delivery, non-service delivery for every single beneficiary for every single um, program area. So that's why you see this yellow. And what the yellow means is that you can still successfully submit this template. Um, and it's going to be the same if you do the direct online um, direct entry. You're going to see these yellow boxes, and that means that you can still submit the template. It's just a warning. And so that's just a mental note that we take is, oh, there's some non-service delivery expenditures in here. It's fine. Um, just going through another example of this is construction. Again, if you're thinking about um, those clinical service um, clinical service activities that happen at a health facility, construction isn't really related to how a beneficiary is really interacting with that site. So that's why this is also considered a warning under, under a service delivery intervention. Same thing with training. Training is of course, you know, a vital part to a lot of what we do. It's not direct service delivery. Same thing regarding this other, other category, which is just kind of a catch-all for anything that may not fit in any of these other cost categories. It's just an other category. And I'll get to the red box here in a minute. 
So let's look at the non-service delivery intervention. So why are these categories considered a warning? Why do we see a yellow box here? And this is because these are salaries for healthcare workers. And the, this is a little tricky, but the kind of the definition of a healthcare worker, let's use an example of a nurse. A nurse is working as a healthcare worker, delivering service services to, to beneficiaries. She's working effectively as a nurse. But the definition of non-service delivery are going to be activities that are not related to um, direct service delivery for beneficiaries. So we're talking about technical assistance that might be happening at a facility or supportive supervision or mentorship activities that are taking place. That may, those may be examples of activities that are performed by a nurse, but that nurse is no longer working in the function of a nurse if she's doing, or, or a doctor or whoever it may be, um, if they're doing supportive supervision or site visits related to uh, you know, mentoring or TA or something like that. Even though their title may be clinical, they are doing a non-clinical function. And so that's where it gets a little tricky in understanding the difference between service delivery, non-service delivery, and allocating those salaries. Again, we're trying to be reasonable. There's, there's, you know, this isn't a perfect science. We want to get it close, but it's not perfect. And so that is why you're seeing under a non-service delivery intervention, there's warnings for healthcare workers' um, salaries. And it's the same thing if we're looking at contracted healthcare worker salaries down here at the bottom. It's also a yellow warning. Um, same thing with pharmaceutical. Anything that's really regarding kind of drug dispension, dis, dis, dispension or something like that, we would probably consider that more service delivery, which is why we don't see that warning here on the service delivery intervention. So it's a warning under non-service delivery, but again, we understand you might just be kind of lumping things together for the sake of um, kind of reducing the burden of, of effort. Uh, and then same thing, financial support for beneficiaries, that's really a bit more of direct service delivery related, um, and then that other other. So then let's talk about the indirect charges. So what does the red boxes mean? The red boxes are errors. So I had said that anything that's yellow, it's just saying, hey, double check this, but you can still submit. Anything that is red, you're going to have to resolve it before you try to submit the template. You will not be able to go forward if you have read anywhere on the template or in the direct entry screen. You need to resolve this. So an example of this is indirect charges. Anything involving indirect charges should go under program management. So I'm going to put expenditures there. And you'll see we don't have a warning for indirect charges under program management. But for a organization's indirect costs, the cost of doing business to your organization, that's not related to service delivery or any kind of work happening at a site or a facility. So we have to delete those and then our red error has been resolved. Um, and it's the same thing um, up here. Let's say we just forgot to enter in a beneficiary for this intervention. It's going to show us a red box. You will not be able to submit your template unless this is resolved. Okay, that is on the template. That was kind of the, that was, I think, the, the biggest change and kind of the, the most um, detailed description um, that um, I can give you about this. So let's now, that was on the template. Let's talk about the, um, the direct entry and what that looks like. Again, I, Datum is closed, so I cannot currently go in the system and do a demo for you. Um, but if we go to Datum Zendesk, you can Google that. Um, let me go back to, this is the home page. Navigate to PEPFAR guidance, navigate to expenditure reporting, and you will see there are a number of different resources here that are available to you that are awesome. They are step-by-step -step screenshots of what you need to do every step of the way. So I'm going to look at the guidance for data entry. We already went through the template. And there's a great screenshots and a PDF. Um, I'm not gonna open this, but you can open this on your own. If, if anything you missed, you can go um, click on this and you'll see all of the errors, all of the warnings, all of the steps that I just went through. Now let's do the same on the direct entry. So I'm going to click on the PDF. And again, this is what all of these resources look like. And so, um, we're going to start by looking at this is just a preview of what you're essentially looking at when you log into datum 
Um, again, you'll have to have your credentials. Um, you will have to log into, you'll have to find the ERB processor app. You'll have to select your operating unit or what country you're going to be reporting from. It's going to be ER, it's going to be fiscal year 23. And then essentially, you know, again, this looks very similar to the expenditure reporting template. And then you will go through the very same steps that we just went through. So let's say we're a prime partner. It looks just like the Excel template, right? And so you will go through, you'll select your program area, you'll select your beneficiaries here on the right, um, in the, the screenshot on the right, and then you'll start entering in your expenditures. The yellows are the warnings, the reds, or I'm sorry, the yellows are, the, yeah, the warnings, the reds are the errors. Um, and um, this is essentially a list of all the different options that you have for both the program area and the beneficiary. You'll enter in your expenditures for program management, um, and then you'll enter in your sub cost category detail. Again, if you want details on, I don't know what this yellow means, I don't know how to resolve this red, you can go through these next few slides and it will go through every single one of them, what they mean and what you need to do to resolve them. I'm going to skip ahead and show what this looks like if you're a subrecipient. Again, prime partners, you will be doing this work on behalf of your subrecipients. The subrecipients do not have access to datum. So what you will need to do when you're entering your subrecipient expenditures, if you're doing this directly and you're not using the template, is you will need to click on add subrecipient once you are looking at the template for your mechanism. Um, you will indicate whether the spend is greater than or less than 25,000, and that will depend on if you report on those cost categories or if you just report on the high level. And then you'll select the program area, the beneficiary, things like that. So it's essentially really the same thing um, with the template um, as, as well as the error checks. And I just realized too, there's one thing that I did not show you um, with the template. Um, and so let's just delete this because we were currently only using an example of primes or subs over 25K. Let me get rid of this. You may be wondering, what would I do if I am a subrecipient that has spend under 25K? You can see, remember when this was all grayed out, when we looked at this, when we had data on the second tab, now that we've cleared that tab, we can see the entry is available again. So if I'm um, a subrecipient organization, I'm going to do basically the exact same thing. Um, I'm going to do, I am program management. I'm going to select, oops, I'm going to select my beneficiary. Um, I'm gonna select non-targeted, non non-disaggregated. And then I may not have the same interventions as the prime, or I may not have the same interventions as other subrecipients. So you will need to go through and select whatever, um, whatever is applicable to the work that you did in the last fiscal year. We've got our, um, our program area. I'm just randomly selecting here our beneficiaries. Um, and so you will notice you don't have that cost category. You don't have the salaries and you don't have the travel and the supplies and things like that. If you were a subrecipient that spent less than 25,000 in the last year, you only have to tell us the total aggregate of the spend by intervention. So for um, men having sex with men, for facility-based testing, for service delivery, I'm just gonna enter in um, $40,000. Um, and uh, same thing over here, uh, maybe I'll enter in $5,000. One thing that you don't want to forget to do is if you are a subrecipient organization, you've got to put in those, um, you've got to put in those, I already forgot how many I put in, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, seven, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12, um, your UEI. Um, and this might actually be also a really good example of um, what I would consider potentially a, a impossible or a unlikely combination rather. Um, Nope, that's not it. I'm not entirely sure what this error is. Um, but what I can do is I can go back to these PDFs and I can better understand what these errors are um, when I go through um, when I go through this. And there's a comprehensive list, even all the way at the at the end, there's an appendix on um, the different warnings and the different errors. So um, Again, if you're a subrecipient that has spent less than 25,000, you can only complete this tab. If we go back over to the, to the second tab, you'll see this tab is now grayed out. I can't complete anything for the prime and I can't complete anything for a sub that has spent more than 25,000. You can only do one tab or the other, one, one template per organization. 
Okay, let's switch back to the presentation. Um, the kind of the last thing that I wanted to go over, that was on data entry. The last thing that um, I'm not going to spend any time on this because again, I don't have access to data, so I don't have much to show you. But once you've completed your template or once you have completed your direct entry in DATUM, you need to submit that information. And so um, what you will do is you will go, you, if you have questions on how to do this, you can go back to DATUM Zendesk. And now there's this section four that says guidance for data submission. So there's one um, set of um, instructions on how to submit the data if you completed the template, and then one set of instructions on how to submit your data if you did the datum um, direct online entry. So you would just select whichever one um, was uh, most applicable to whatever you did. And then again, it's the same format, just a lot of, of great detail in here on all of the steps that you need to take, what it looks like um, on each of the screens. So um, let's go back and you can see um, I've um, created links to each of these instructions um, going back to the, the, the entry. You can select um, these hyperlinks here for either the, the online entry. There's instructions here for the template. Down here at the bottom, it's a little bit cut off for me, but um, there is actually, if you go to Datum Zendesk, there is a demo that will um, it's a video that someone has created um, where they will walk through how you do the online entry in datum you can watch that demo it's only five minute video um, if you want to better understand how to approach that new entry um, you can do it you can take a look at that video um, and then same um, i've linked to the instructions for the submission if you did the direct online um, submission the entry or if you did the template um, here's the instructions on how to do that so that was a lot of me talking, but I wanted to be sure that we spent as much time as possible in this webinar really going through what I think are the biggest changes this year to the interface. Um, again, anyone familiar with ER, a lot of this is the same, right? It's the program area, the beneficiary, the cost category, the threshold of the 25,000 or not. It's really just a matter of um, the, the method in which you are um, entering it is really the only thing that's different. But um, if you're feeling overwhelmed or if you're feeling really nervous, um, there's a number of different resources. We looked at a lot of them on Datum Zendesk. Um, in the next section, we'll go through other resources that are available to you. Um, but don't feel overwhelmed by this. Um, I think it's a change, but once you kind of get accustomed to it or you get um, sort of more um, uh, familiar with it, um, I think you'll see it's, it's actually pretty intuitive. Um, Grace, um, do you have any questions that you want to, that you're seeing in the chat? Yes, thanks everyone for your questions. Um, there were a few questions that came in just about that this change of the separate um, template reports, um, the fact that you can only fill out one template, um, you know, per partner. Um, so just wanting to clarify again, Aaron, um, Eric asks, for example, I work with over sub Sorry, I work with over 60 subrecipients, both CSOs and facilities. Does this imply over 60 separate ER reports? Um, Eric is about to have a really bad day, but yes, unfortunately, um, that is that is essentially um, what is is being asked. It's not as if those 60, and I don't know if this is you know how long this this mechanism has been operating and implementing, but it's not as if these you know, subrecipient expenditures haven't been reported on in the, in the past, but I think the coordination of this, um, we understand is um, a little bit more of a lift um, than it was in years past. I guess you could look at it in one way of, you know, if you had any subrecipients that spent less than 25,000, you needed to sort of coordinate a template or you coordinate some sort of information, and then you would add that information onto your template now you're coordinating, you know, the completion and the successful, like, you know, receiving um, 60 templates to you, but it's just a matter of keeping track of those. You don't have to add their data with your data in the same way that you did in the years past. But um, unfortunately, uh, this was not a change that USAID had control over. Um, uh, you know, the 
the State Department um, for, for the US government is the one that really sets all of the policy and the decision making around expenditure reporting. And so this was um, their decision to, um, to make this change. And so we are acknowledging that this is a little bit more of a coordinated effort for the prime partner. Um, I think you know the the statistics that they quoted us was I think the average number of subrecipients per mechanism is around I think they said like seven. So from their perspective, it wasn't. I mean that's a you know that number is a little you know you can there's a lot of things you can you know interpret with that number, but acknowledging there's going to be some mechanisms that have none. There's going to be some. I mean there's some that have more than sixty, um, and so it is it's just unfortunate. Um, but um, I guess it's just another reason why we just say to try to to try to come up with a system and, and try to get ahead of it. Um, I guess the benefit is just any subrecipient would spend less than twenty five thousand will have less effort, but you still have to sort of coordinate that with them. So that's that's certainly um, you know acknowledging that that level of effort that's going into it. Great, thanks, Aaron. Um, one other question on data entry: uh, If you enter data directly, will you be able to edit multiple times and export? Yeah, great question. So once the data is entered and saved, and it, we didn't really talk about any of this because I, I can't see it either. So I can't fully um, you know, know entirely how it functions. And I don't have a partner account either. So it's harder for me to kind of understand um, all of the different steps. But if you look at those datum, um, those slide decks on the Datum Zendesk website, um, it it will it will answer those questions. But our understanding is that once you submit the data, you can save it. You can go back and let's say you're doing the direct entry, you can go back and you can change it if you want later. Um, and um, you even I I because I can't see it, I don't fully know. I think if you upload the template, then you can still edit the information that's in there. You can certainly always recall or reject a template um, without me being able to be in there and kind of, you know, manipulate it. I, I don't fully know how it happens, but I know that you can edit um, your submissions before you click that submit button um, and you can export. Um, our understanding is we actually asked just, just asked this question to the State Department on Monday. Um, you, the export, I believe, is going to be in a PDF. Um, they are not able to accommodate Excel um, exports, which is really unfortunate considering we're talking about numbers. But um, our understanding is if you're a prime partner and you do want to have a record of what was um, what you're submitting, there should be some sort, or if you're a, an AOR or a COR uh, and you want to actually look at something rather than go into datum, our understanding is that there will be some sort of a PDF export where you can look at the submission that way. Great. There were a couple questions on COVID related expenses. Um, if we have COVID related expenses to HIV, how would these be reported against various intervention areas or would these be reported separately? Yeah, great question. If it is COVID and HIV related, you would report those expenditures to ER this year. There is not a COVID um, program area or sub program area or anything like that. So it would just be um, whatever those HIV related activities are that are also sort of overlapping with COVID, just you would have to pick the most representative program area for those activities. So if it was, um, you know, like, and, and this is probably not going to be something that's an exact science, but you know, if it's like, purchasing additional PPE or testing or something, tests or something like that, and you're, it's to support a clinic, I would just say, you know, pick, pick care and treatment or pick, you know, some pick testing um, or something like that, whatever is sort of closest to whatever that um, COVID slash HIV activity is. Great. Maybe I'll do one more question and then we can continue answering questions in the chat. Um, when we move on, but uh, just a program management related question. Um, by putting all indirect charges under program management, it makes it impossible to keep the permitted program management percentage. What would you suggest? It makes it impossible to keep what? To stay under, I guess, their um, oh. required program management percent. Okay, this is another excellent question. So, <laughs> So, okay, there's a number of things to unpack here. So program management, um, you know, this is a, is a number that I think at the time of budgeting, 
um, it is difficult at times for the U.S. government to accurately estimate what the program management budget should be for an organization. Um, we are working to improve that. We are trying to find ways to do that in a better way. I feel very passionate about how challenging it is to estimate program management correctly and communicate that to partners. Um, it is it is something that we continue to work on. Um, I guess the only other thing that I will say is, you know, in the when you think about the broader PEPFAR space, um, this is a number that um, I think sometimes is heavily questioned. Um, not that it's bad, not that there's a number that is quote unquote too high because there is not, despite what gossip may be out there or despite somebody that may be even saying, oh, you can't go above a certain amount. I can assure you that there is nothing written down that says that you can you cannot exceed X dollar or X threshold of program management. But you, th this number is important on, so let's just set aside any kind of, you know, issues with getting the budget right. On the expenditure side, um, we do ask that you report your expenditures accurately because we are actively working behind the scenes to try to work off of your expenditures to set future budgets in some sort of mathematical, you know, calculation. So the expenditures that you report to us are going to, we're trying to really nudge people into using that data um, to set the future program management budgets. And so whatever you report to us, number one, you want to make sure it's accurate. And I see a lot of times organizations, especially new organizations that sort of misinterpret the definition of program management. You sort of see yourself as a program manager, you see yourself managing activities, and that's all very true generally and broadly. But when we're talking about program management, we're really talking about the cost of doing business for your organization. We're talking about the office rent for your, um, your organization. You're talking about the salaries for your financial staff, for your um, administrative staff. Um, there, um, is, there are probably going to be something like your chief of party might have some um, administrative responsibilities. You might want to cost share some of that person's salary to program management and then a portion you could allocate to the other more programmatic um, interventions. But it's essentially that number is important because you don't want to put all of your expenditures in program management because it's going to look like you have very high admin costs. So we will see we, anytime I see something around 50 percent under program management, I know that's not right there. That that is a partner that is allocating their expenditures to program management incorrectly. And you want to go back and look and see. Are we talking more about something administrative and related to the organization and what that organization is spending in order to implement all of their activities? Or are we talking about specific HIV activities? So just be really careful in how you are allocating those expenditures because, um, you know, there, well, I say that there's not a high threshold. Anytime I really start to see like 45, 50, like I know that that was just a misinterpretation. That's a data quality error. And we don't want your organization to come off looking as if only 50% of the budget we give you goes to beneficiaries, because we know that that's not accurate. Um, and then more specifically related to this question on um, uh, expenditures exceeding budgets, the only other caveat that I will say, when we, when we look at your budget execution, and we do, we look at how much you spent against how much you were budgeted for each mechanism as a whole we only at the u.s government when we're setting our budgets we're only setting budgets i mean we really are only taking into consideration the prime partners program management because again we're still kind of working on getting a good estimate for the primes program management if we were to try to include the subrecipients program management budgets I really don't have any idea how we would be able to do that. I don't even know when you all are able to fully know how to do that. I mean, it's it, we would never be able to know that by March or April before an implementation year begins. So what that means data wise is when we analyze this, starting with last year, when we started including subrecipient, more detailed subrecipient reporting, what we're now seeing is program management expenditures are exceeding budgets basically across the board for all mechanisms that have subrecipients. And what we are messaging 
to country teams and other kind of decision makers is this is a limitation with how we're setting budgets and how we're reporting expenditures. And unless we can figure out a way to ensure we're getting both the prime and all of the subrecipient um, program management budget um, set at the very beginning, we're, ne we're never going to be aligned. Um, and so we just have to kind of take that into consideration when we're looking at like an agency level program management amount or um, a country level program management um, budget execution number. That's just, we want those numbers to be right, but we're also looking pre basically across the board is every, every country is overspending their program management budget for those two reasons. We're probably not getting it right at the budgeting, at the time of budgeting for the prime, and then we're missing the subrecipient expenditures. Great, thanks, Aaron. Um, there are still a handful of questions in the chat, but maybe, um, Aaron, you could continue working on those um, written responses and we can move on um, to our next section, uh, which hopefully will be helpful um, for folks uh, because we'll be pointing you to a lot of different resources um, that may have a lot of answers to your questions um, around here. So uh, next slide, please. Great. Um, so just going to walk through um, some of the additional materials that are available online. Aaron did give kind of a demo of um, what this Datum Zendesk um, web page looks like and how to navigate. So I'll be repeating some of this, but um, really just know that this datumzendesk.com is going to be the hub for all of the materials that you'll want. Um, there's some really great and comprehensive materials that are posted here um, online. So if you missed anything today or need another refresher, as you're starting the process of ER, just make sure you return to these resources. Um, again, Datum Zendesk can give you some guidance for both the data entry process as well as data submission. Um, it'll um, it's also where the actual template, the ER templates are posted. Um, you can find the PEPFAR classification guide and a summary of what's new from this year's reporting, um, which we walked through in this presentation, but you can find a nice summary page on Datum Zendesk as well that um, just goes over what these changes are. Um, next slide. So I'll just give um, a quick plug for this financial classification reference guide. Um, this is a really great resource that, again, is posted to the Zendesk website. Um, this guide is extremely useful and will really answer a lot of your questions on how do I report a particular expenditure? You know, what program area does it fall under? Um, is it service delivery or non-service delivery? And what cost, cost category um, should I be selecting in, in the template? Um, so a great tip for this document. It is a bit long, um, but if you download it, you can control F and look for a topic that um, you're trying to understand. You know, if you're trying to figure out what beneficiary you should be selecting for a dreams intervention, for example, um, search for dreams and um, just read some of the guidance that's around, um, that's in that section, and you'll be able to get some answers to your questions. Next slide. Um, Aaron did go over as well this um, where you can find this step-by-step -step instruction guide on the errors and warnings. Um, so just again to mention, uh, if you're getting errors and warnings um, and not able to submit your template, um, just read through those materials again and it'll go through kind of the causes and background um, for each of those warnings um, and help you resolve those. Next slide. And finally, if all else fails, you can't find an answer in any of this guidance, um, or you may run into some technical glitches during reporting, um, you can always submit a help desk ticket. Uh, so you can see this is on the home page and in the red box, um, there's a link to, to submit a request. Um, so if, if you're having issues, for example, an invalid template that's not uploading and you haven't been able to figure out how to resolve any errors, 
Um, if you, for example, have a missing mechanism that you can't find, um, you uh, aren't able to like reject or recall your template, or if you're having password, uh, you know, or username access issues, all of these things could be resolved by submitting um, a, a request. Um, so they should hopefully be um, pretty responsive to you if you run into any of those problems, um, but just submit a, a request through that datumzendesk.org, uh, sorry, .com website. Um, next slide, please. So just to mention also um, some USAID specific resources that um, we produce um, here at, at USAID um, headquarters for implementing partners. So there's a few things that um, we send out at the beginning of expenditure reporting um, just to kind of help smooth the process. Uh, one is we create these um, COP budget reference files, um, which is you know really just a summary file to um, reference what your COP budget budgets were as you start to um, go into expenditure reporting. Um, second, we'll send you any additive data reporting guidance that comes out. Um, we'll send you some best practices um, for IP reporting. And finally, a financial data quality framework um, where we just kind of walk through uh, a few different types of data quality checks that you can do as um, before you finalize your expenditure reporting um, submission. Uh, so those things that are um, starred are distributed um, via the USAID country teams um, the week of September 18th, uh, or you can always reach out to this email address that's listed. It's oha.ea at usaid.gov um, and request a copy of these resources if um, you haven't seen them by, by that date or if you um, it didn't, didn't receive them through your country team. Next slide. Um, just to mention also some additional resources um, for local partners, uh, we do want to mention that through the ASAP implementing uh, mechanism, there um, are available uh, consultants that um, can help support USAID local partners. Um, but just to note that um, these consultants can only support local partners that are located in Africa um, throughout the ER and HRH reporting periods. So these consultants would be available um, to help with things like categorizing and allocating expenditures. Um, if there's a, additional interpretation that you may need help with from the PEPFAR financial framework, um, or just help kind of reviewing data completeness um, prior to submission, uh, the consultants can help out with that. Um, note that they can't actually submit the um, templates for you, of course, but they um, can help with that process um, as needed. So again, this is um, just for those local partners that are um, located in Africa. Um, although I will note that uh, you know, if uh, local partners are based in Asia or Western Hemisphere, there is still technical assistance available to you um, through USAID headquarters. So you can always feel free to reach out um, to that email address. that I mentioned if you're a local partner, things that the consultants um, can help you with. Um, and great, I think I mostly covered this as well. Um, so uh, just to say that, yeah, the USAID um, uh, backstops, um, sorry about that. Sorry, the US, so USAID headquarters have um, ER backstops that are um, supporting each country team. So these backstops are available for technical assistance, um, again, as needed, um, often helping with um, things like program area, cost categorizations, um, and things like that. So um, if you have questions, uh, the uh, USAID ER backstop at headquarters are always um, happy to help. Again, that email address is listed there. So I'll pause for any questions now. Um, Aaron, are there any uh, questions that have come through the box on? Um, really quickly before you go on, Grace, there's a couple of major and kind of tricky um, questions that I just kind of wanted to go over that I'm seeing in the Q&A very quickly. Um, so the first is on the 
fixed amount awards or the FAAs. So a fixed amount award is essentially, you should know if you are um, on a fixed amount award, uh, that basically just means that USAID is, um, is, is, is sort of paying or reimbursing, um, what's paying uh, an organization for work that has been completed based on certain milestones or something like that. And as a result of that, it doesn't matter whether the organization sort of, you know, spends more or less um, than the amount that they're getting from USA. They know that they're getting this amount and they know that they need to meet these milestones and deliverables. And this is the amount that they're getting. And so no additional disaggregation contractually um, is required for those FAA awards. So this is where it's tricky with expenditure reporting because we acknowledge um, that there's a reason why those uh, fixed amount awards exist and there's a reason why there's benefits to them and there's that's why we have them. Um, but the so then the kind of the I think the confusion, but then also the question comes in on. But then why are we being asked to do expenditure reporting? Because we don't have to give you this breakdown for our contractual requirements. So why are you asking this um, for us, which is for expenditure reporting? So we legally cannot require you to submit an expenditure report. But what I would say is that uh, as, as Grace is about to, to go through and we're talking about data use, USAID and the US government, broadly speaking, looks at all of the expenditure data. We would love to see a complete report of expenditures and it's really the best way in which we can fully understand what we are doing in a country. Um, it's not even really to some degree, you know, wanting to, for those fixed amount of awards that we're trying to, to you know, micromanage you in a way that we're not doing um, on another side. It's we're wanting to ensure that your um, contributions are appearing um, when it comes to looking at investments made in Uganda or investments that are made in Burundi or something like that. So I would say that this is something that if you have concerns about reporting to ER, um, we would strongly encourage you to, to report for the sake of just your organization showing up and your organization, um, your contributions to um, PEPFAR and, and the investments made in each of the countries in which you work. Um, but if you're concerned about it still, talk to your ACOR about it and let them know your concerns and let them know your thoughts. Um, again, we legally cannot require it of you, but we certainly um, would suggest it if, if at all possible, um, just so that we can, again, better understand the investments made by the mechanism. So that's FAAs. Um, the next question that I've seen is on the, the tiers of subrecipients. And this is another good question. Um, so, what this means is that there's some subrecipients that um, and I so one thing um, that we didn't mention is that USA we're, uh, we're again we're preparing to send out a number of materials. The explanation I just gave on FAAs is going to be included, and this explanation on tiers of subs will also be included. So make sure that you ask your ACOR for this communication if you don't receive it in a week or so. But this is going to essentially explain. The tiers of subs is essentially like you've got what we call our first tier of subs. So you've got the prime and then they're um, they're contracting out to a sub and then that sub is considered the first tier. But then sometimes that sub is also subcontracting and that can go down to like a second level and a third level and even a fourth level. And so um, it's important that um, what so I think ideally um the state department in wanting to better understand subrecipient expenditures would like to see all subrecipients including all of the tiers i think usaid is a little bit more um we are understanding the complexities of second tiers and third tiers and coordinating all of that so what we are essentially saying is when we are defining subrecipient we're essentially saying that first tier recipient should be responsible for collecting information from the sub tiers, but we're not asking those sub tiers, the second tier and the third tier to complete their own individual subrecipient report. The, we, we're okay if you want to stop at the first tier of subrecipients. Um, that doesn't mean that you wouldn't have, you know, like 30 first tier subrecipients. But if you've got 30 first tier subrecipients and half of those also have second tier or third tier, we're not looking for you to give us templates. We are looking for those expenditures, but we don't necessarily need templates. And so 
the first tier can essentially coordinate with the lower tier subrecipients. I know this is kind of really in the weeds, but um, and then you would aggregate all of those and you would report as a subrecipient um, at the first tier level. And then you would report either on the 25, you would either report on the um, greater than 25,000 in expenditures tab, or you would report on the under 25,000 expenditures tab with um, all of those tiers um, added together at that first tier level. That doesn't really make a lot of sense the way I explained it, but again, we have it written down in guidance and we're going to be disseminating that. So keep an eye out for that. Um, yeah, and then the other question I think we saw was just on decimals. Um, you do not use decimals, please round up decimals if you are reporting in ER. Um, so that they're all just whole numbers. And um, Grace, I'm going to keep looking through the Q&A, but those were the two big ones that I had for, um, I saw a couple questions that I wanted to address. Okay, great. Wonderful. Well, let's move on then to um, this next section, uh, which is on PEPFAR financial data use. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Great, so we just wanted to spend a little bit of time, uh, you know, if you're wondering where all of this data goes, um, I wanted to talk through uh, a little bit on data use um, and to assure everyone that we do use the data um, that you spend so much time collecting and reporting. Um, these are just some screenshots to show you some of the visuals and trend data over time that we end up looking at. Um, you know, we're looking at things um, like budget execution, um, how financial performance is looking relative to programmatic performance um, and things like that. So it really gives a lot of insight um, into program um, planning, program management, et cetera. Next slide. Um, and so one of the main things we look at is, you know, um, this connection uh, between financial data and programmatic improvements, right? Um, so having access to routine, standardized, and comprehensive financial data across the full PEPFAR portfolio uh, for multiple years allows us to really monitor and plan our programs in different and better ways. Um, so we also use the data um, to think about how to allocate resources at the partner and agency level, uh, think about shifts in strategy, and it can also inform, uh, you know, future bud budgeting processes. So one of the questions we're looking at um, as, as we kind of analyze the data that comes in is understanding what the purpose of the spend is. So that's one of the things that that program area classification that we went over really allows us to do. So understanding, you know, how investments were spent over time, um, how are we focusing our resources and are is that focused on the right things um, in order to reach our targets? Uh, you know, what's our data telling us about the types of activities and the program areas that we should be focusing on in order to get closer to epidemic control. And who are we serving? Um, so that beneficiary classification that we went through um, is really giving us a lot um, to glean from the data about how we're focusing our resources on the right populations. Um, and so you can see how a budget would then be divided across all of these different beneficiary populations that we can then visualize um, and see and analyze relative to you know, what our programmatic um, targets and goals are, or if we should be switching our resources around you know, to target um, different types of groups. And then finally, the, the cost category designation is helping us understand what we're actually spending on. So are we spending on the right things in order to meet our program goals and targets? Um, you know, how should we potentially shift our investments into the next fiscal year to achieve uh, program success? So uh, just to, to bring it all together to um, if IPs are um, interested in accessing the data sets, uh, you know, the full cleaned data sets once it's processed, um, you can do that uh, on PEPFAR 
Panorama Spotlight. So Panorama Spotlight is the public facing data source uh, with the expenditure data. So of course there are certain things that are aggregated for this public facing data source, um, but you can find you know, mechanism totals for PEPFAR IP expenditures here um, and download the data set there. And then the next slide um, is just showing some of the dashboards and visuals that are also available on that PEPFAR Spotlight um, uh, hub. And so uh, there's lots of kind of preset visuals and analysis that is done with all of this data. Um, so just wanting to kind of show you um, how helpful this can be and a really powerful tool um, to help, you know, storytelling and visualize the data once it's um, come through and processed. Um, so uh, also know that you can reach out to oha.ea at USAID, of course, um, for additional help analyzing this financial data. Um, and just note that Panorama Spotlight um, website there for you to access this data once it's clean and process processed. Thanks. So we have, I think, about you know, 10 minutes left. Um, maybe, Aaron, we can flip back to answering some other pending questions. Yes, that sounds great. Um, I'm just going back to some of the questions here. Um, let me see. Um, so the last question here from Pinky is talking about um, advanced funds that were received for startup and if they are deducted from the last year of implementation or deducted from the last invoice project closeout costs. So um, to answer that, that's just a, a reminder that um, it's sort of the regardless of what the intention of the sort of when when the, the funds were intended to be used, whether it was from the previous implementation year. Uh, or whether or not you're kind of not reporting certain expenditures because you're going to reporting them next year, um, it's important to remember the cash basis of accounting. So you would only be reporting on expenditures that incurred this, um, this the fiscal year that is about to end, the, the October 1st, 2022 to September 30, um, 2023. So, um, you know, I, if you had, um, if you, if you didn't spend the funds this year, um, I wouldn't worry about reporting it. Even if, you know, you're, if you're talking about funds that were sort of, you know, accrued or something in the previous year, just worry about those funds that cleared your bank account this year. Um, in order to sort of determine whether or not it should be reported. Um, I wouldn't worry about going, you know, too, you know, too in the weeds about some of the timing of things because things are going to be off, right? We know that in September 30, a lot of expenditures are accrued and you're not paying that out. And so what we'll see a lot of times is a lot of expenditures accrued in September for fiscal year 23, but we're not going to see that until the fiscal year 24 reporting. And that may not make a lot of sense in some ways, um, but if you think about year to year to year, if you're still kind of doing that um, same methodology, it kind of smooths out in a way um, because you're still going to have that big, um, whatever that September is going into the next year and then the next year and the next year. So it's kind of the same thing um, carried through. Um, Pamela has a question on service delivery cost drivers. I think that's maybe when we were going through the template. I don't fully understand the question, but if you still have it, if you could just give a little bit more information. Um, George had a question on listing all the changes at once. Um, when these slides are posted to the ASAP website, um, you can see the slides that I presented with all the different changes. Also, um, let's just navigate there right now. Um, let me move this out of the way. If we go to back to Datum, the Datum Zendesk website, and you go to I'm minimize all these things. If you go to PEPFAR guidance, and then you go to expenditure reporting, and you scroll down to section two on the template and reference documents, you will see there's a document that says here, what's new for COP22 fiscal year 23, PEPFAR program expenditure reporting. And you can click that and that will give you a full list of everything that we talked about today. 
so there's sort of two separate resources. There's the resources that are on Data and Zendesk, and those are already available and live to you right now. You can download the template today. And as the resources that um, Grace mentioned, um, there's a really nice um, kind of comprehensive message that is going to all of your ACORs. Um, and that will have a little bit more of the detail that we talked about with like the fixed amount of words and the tiers of subs and things like that. Um, so Kenneth, um, a link to help enable us to use the program and financial data to be more prudent and efficient with the project funds. Yeah, again, um, so that's going to be if you Google PEPFAR um, Spotlight, um, that is where you'll be able to look at the, the data down either through dashboards or you can download the data sets. You'll note that this data um, is de-identified. So for anyone who may be kind of concerned about your organization being called out for what you're sending to us, there certainly is a data set that is internal only to USG. And then there's a data set that's being made publicly available as we want to be transparent in our investments to um, our external stakeholders, our civil society, um, the many partners that are very keen on understanding um, what PEPFAR is spending you know, $6 billion on um, around the world. So this is why we have PEPFAR Spotlight is so that you can see some information, but it is de-identified at the mechanism level to um, ensure that we're protecting um, the proprietary, um, the different things that are proprietary to your organization and how you're reporting. Um, if drivers drive beneficiaries to the clinic and home, wouldn't they be service delivery? Um, we were directed last year to put them as non-service delivery. Um, yeah, I mean, I would, What the, this is a great example of um, another resource that I would like to note is when you are in Datum Zendesk, under guidance, under expenditure reporting, you will see something called the Financial Classification Reference Guide. And if I click on that, what we're essentially going to be looking at is all of the definitions um, for um, each of the categories that we went over. So we've got our program areas, we have our beneficiaries, and some of our cost categories. And so when you have a lot of questions like this, um, it's really easy to um, just go, you can do a control find um, and take a look and, and see, um, you know, all the different areas where you might be able to have some of your questions answered. You're not going to find all of the answers to your questions, but that's why you have multiple resources available. Again, any partner that is a local organization based in Africa, um, I believe we will have, all of those um, organizations will have a technical assistance consultant who can help you. Um, everyone um, on my team uh, is covering all, all of the countries worldwide, so you can also contact one of us by reaching out to oha.ea at usa.gov um, in addition to these, these resources. Um, but specifically, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the, the question here on um, if the drivers drive beneficiaries to clinic and home, would they be service delivery? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that makes sense to me, but I, we, we would just have to maybe know a little bit more of the context. Um, you know, you know best about your program and you know best about what, how you want to represent the work that you're doing. So make sure that you're definitely looking at the definitions of all of these activities so that you can be categorizing correctly. Um, but if you feel in some ways that, you know, I really just don't think that this is, you know, representative of what we're really doing, I would, you know, go with your instincts and go with, with what you're thinking. Um, for the FAA question, reporting on the expenditure or the milestones received, I mean, this is a good question. Um, and I think one that we haven't, to my knowledge, specifically talked about, um, I think it would, yeah, I, I, I will be honest, I think we haven't really talked about this. Um, and so I don't really have an answer for you because I see the pros and cons of reporting one way or another. Um, so we'll see as we're finalizing our guidance document, our USA guidance document, that we will put some guidance in there. But um, I can't give you an answer right now because I don't fully, we just haven't talked about what's best. And, you know, again, just acknowledging the challenges with the FAA reporting, we appreciate any partner that does report. So we're trying to make this as, as easy as possible. Um, are GUCS considered subrecipients as well? Um, grants under contract. I'm sorry, I don't know the, the entire um, 
definition of that. Um, but there is in this guidance document, if you search for subrecipient, there are um, there are additional um, definitions on subrecipients. So I would just um, suggest that you go and look at the classification reference guide for that information. Um, I do also want to note with the very little time that we have left, can we actually um, uh, uh, launch our last poll? Uh, so there's the survey, the survey, yeah, the feedback survey, but then if we have one more um, poll that we would like to ask, if you can just take the next um, five seconds uh, to just quickly take a look at that poll, we want to just get a better understanding of the comfort level. We covered a lot of information here. Um, you're not going to, especially if this is your first time, you're not going to be able to absorb everything that I said the first time. Um, a lot of this information is new to me. I just learned it two or three weeks ago, and it took me a second to look through that new ER template and get oriented to it. So I don't want anyone to stress. I don't want anyone to feel nervous. Um, if you are, that's okay. This is a safe space. But um, just understand that really getting started early is going to be important because there are so many resources available, whether it's just written down in Datum Zendesk or whether it's individuals you can reach out to. But you're not probably going to get it all just from this presentation. Um, so don't stress. Um, and then the last thing I just want to, to touch on is, again, we, we um, in the past, we have had um, uh, Sushant Mukherjee um, present. He is he has he is an expert at ER, and he's been doing ER I think essentially since the beginning. And if we um, have been really we've really benefited from having him speak from the partner perspective to all of you on this call as implementing partners. And again, unfortunately, he wasn't able to join, and we kind of ran out of time to go through his slides but he has really, really excellent um, suggestions on, from his perspective as a partner doing ER, what he's offering to you on what can be helpful so that as you go through, through ER, what are some best practices, some things that are good to keep in mind. So um, we're not gonna be able to go through these, but when these slides are posted, please take a look because these are excellent, excellent, excellent um, um, suggestions to help you. Um, I think that's all we have time for. Um, I might send it back to Melissa to see if there's any other closing comments, but just wanted to say thank you all for joining during what I know is a very busy time this year. And thank you for all the questions and um, for the attention today. And, and again, just don't hesitate to reach out in the next couple of weeks. Excellent. Thank you so much, Erin and Grace, for um, presenting today's webinar. I know it was um, super helpful for all of our participants and attendees. Um, just a reminder that today's webinar was recorded, and the recording of today's presentation, um, as well as the PDF of today's presentation and any other resources that Erin and Grace have mentioned, will be available at the ASAP resources page um, by the end of this week. So um, look out for it tomorrow or Friday. Um, you'll also receive an email with these um, resources linked as well. Um, and any remaining questions that were outstanding, we'll also make sure to attach um, an attachment with any um, answers to those questions. Um, and again, thank you so much, Erin and Grace, for presenting today. Um, and we hope you all have an excellent rest of your day um, and appreciate your time this morning. Thank you so much.